HRC, 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 Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, Hebrew reader, church. Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother, Kasafo. And I'm your brother, Zakwa. Hope you all are enjoying the Shabbat today. We thank you all for taking the time to join us today in fellowship. And we also thank you all for taking the time to watch the other lessons and whatever work Allah may have put in your heart to share the content and such. Um, anything before we get going, Zakwa? Uh, praise Allah uh, pray to Allah for us all being able to be here today and to be able to continue growing and going upon our journeys. I pray Allah prospers us all unto perfect prosperity and uh, Allah keeps you all this day. Thank you, brother. Amen. All right. We are continuing. Hopefully you caught part one and part two of understanding spiritual fornication and idolatry. And hopefully it's been helpful in here today. Let's continue understanding idolatry and spiritual fornication and get what we need so that we may have the essentials <laughs> to overcome this thing. All right. We need to continue to understand the spirits at work to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves because we have insight into this warfare that we are in. Let's get into fornication and the lust thereof. Zachua, can you read Testament of Judah, chapter 17, verse 2, please? Beware, therefore, my children, of fornication and the love of money. The love of money is akin to, or a work of lust. So we are getting understanding from Judah of how lust and fornication works. Now, why are we going to Judah for guidance on this? It's because he overcame fornication, lust, and jealousy to help us understand what we ought to do. Can we get a little insight on him in Testament of Judah chapter 12, verse 2, please? And walk not after your lust. There's the lust that he overcame, and he learned that we shouldn't walk after our own desires, but only Elohim's desires. And we know what his desire is from the recent lessons and the growth within playlists or series that can be summed up to say he requires us to love mercy, do justly, and walk humbly with him. Continue, please. Nor in the imaginations of your thoughts and haughtiness of heart. So take accountability not to walk after your own desires and then also Beware of spiritual fornication following the imaginations that idols give us to lift us up, especially fornication herself, who teaches arrogance to lift us up. Continue, please. And glory not in the deeds and strength of your youth, for this also is evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's evil because Ahaya wants us to glory in understanding and knowing him by keeping Yache's commandments. Understanding that it's them strengthening us in loving kindness to do so, and it's not us ourselves. Can you read First John if you don't have anything before we go? I will. You know, I'm going to jump in. you touching on my tribe real quick. <laughs> um, when it says walk not after your lust, um, specifically the tribe of Judah, and I'm pretty sure other people may have um, may have experiences with this. When you desire something, you are completely given over to it. Like you have to fulfill it. And that's why when he says, nor in the imaginations of your thoughts and the haughtiness of your heart, it's because... Um, when you desire something, you make the circumstance for you to fulfill it. 
So that's why I said in the imaginations of your thoughts and the haughtiness of your heart, because when pride comes in, you start creating a way for you to fulfill it. So we have to be very mindful of allowing, first off, lust of fornication to lead us to what we desire as far as Judites. Um, I'm pretty sure Costa is going to get into it. We're not supposed to be desiring anything that's outside of what Alahim desires. And that's what Casa spoke on just a moment ago. But also, we have to be mindful of what is leading us. Specifically for the tribe of Judah, we're going to give ourselves over to one or two things. We're going to give ourselves over to the devil, and we're going to be led by the devil, which is the lust of fornication that's going to lead us. Or we're going to be led by Elohim, and it's going to be um, the Holy Spirit and Elohim guiding us and good works. So we have to be really, really mindful of what we're giving ourselves over to and and projecting um, the imaginations of your thought. A lot of times, you'll start creating a scenario in your mind to be able to fulfill your lust. So it may not be real, it may not be true, but you will start doing it so that you so that you have the justification to do what you're going to do, and that's not right. I'm done, cousin. Mm -hmm. Praise Allah. It makes sense why Judah spake on the spirit of truth versus the spirit of deceit that's within us. To know, like, we have accountability, no matter what we may be thinking in our minds. And we need to take heed to our conscience and hold ourselves accountable to that spirit of truth. Well, the commandment. That's yeah. the thing right there. Because you can... You can try to do all kind of flips and all kind of somersaults to get around the commandments, but at the end of the day, the commandments are the commandments, and it stands, and you're in the wrong. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Thanks for that insight. Um, First John chapter 2, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is speaking of Yahweh's commandments, which vicariously are the Father's commandments because everything he speaks is what the Father commanded him to speak. That's the real way of actually knowing him and his Father. All right. Jeremiah 9 and 24, please. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am Ahia, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith Ahia. See that Elohim delights for us to be obedient. Understanding and knowing is not of our own doing. Rejoicing in them for the love and kindness to prosper us to partake in their holiness. As you see, it says... I am Ahaya, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. So wherever loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness is actually being exercised, it's him doing it. It's them doing it. Let me correct myself. It's the Alahayim. So that's why glorying in ourselves is not true. It's not wise and it's not profitable for us, nor does it delight our Elohim. So be mindful of glorying in thoughts about what we used to be able to do in youth or what we can currently do in our youth or what we can do at all for that matter, remembering we are unprofitable servants. If you don't have anything, I'll keep rolling. I do, actually. Um, two things. One, it wouldn't behoove us to glory in our youth or glory in our abilities, seeing that it's Elohim that's actually given us the ability to be able to do what we're doing. So it's actually a slap in his face. 
that we're actually glorying in something that he's prospering us to do and and not being mindful of him and of them, of Allah Hayim and what they're actually doing or working in you. So that right there wouldn't behoove you. Also, um, Kasa, when you were speaking about um, to be obedient, understanding and knowing it's not of our own doing, this which goes straight into what I just explained. Um, the the word obedient is very interesting. It means to um, attentively hearkening. That is compliance or submission, and that would usually be to one of authority, or had that has authority over you. It it says attentively hearkening. So that means that you're literally putting forth the effort to listen. And then after you listen attentively or you put forth the effort to listen, you comply with what you heard. So I, I thought that was important as to what you're touching on. That's essential. All of it is essential. And to be able to fulfill that intent to be complying is not is something essential not to miss because that goes with why we don't want to walk in imagination of the thoughts of our heart or our lust because that would be what would hinder us from complying when we hear. Mm -hmm. so. That would make us disobedient. Mm -hmm. Because either we're in disobedience when we try not to hear or we're in disobedience when we actually do hear. We may not be attentively listening, but we may hear. But to be obedient, you have to be attentively listening, but you may hear and then you may not comply with your disobedience. So you can yeah. see the, the missteps as far as be actually striving to be obedient. Right. Mm -hmm. Take heed how we hear. It's essential. That's something to um make sure to correct. If I notice it grieves me to hear the commandments or hear what to do according to the scriptures. As something to work on changing in my heart to make it something that is delightful and that I rejoice in it's to overcome these things. We know jealousy works with vainglory from Dan when we talked about it. So when we get lifted up glorying in our works or abilities, let's see what happens. Test in the Judah chapter 12, verse 3, please. Since I also gloried that in wars no comely woman's face ever enticed me, and reproved Reuben, my brother, concerning Bilhah, the wife of my father. When we glory in ourselves, we go into fornication, not to have compassion upon the shortcomings of others, thinking we are better than them. This arrogance hurts us. Continue, please. The spirits of jealousy and of fornication arrayed themselves against me until I lay with Bethshua the Canaanite and Tamar, who was his spouse to my sons. Jealousy gets placed to help get us into the spirit of fornication and its lust when we glory in ourselves. Once vain glory gets us and that spirit of fornication comes in, we lose compassion and will look down on others who may struggle in areas we don't, or that are just struggling in anything, as we will think arrogantly as if we are better than they are, being led by idols ourselves. The sad part is that all that just helps more idols array themselves against us to commit some sin, as we've seen in Judah's case, we're being led by idols to glory in himself and look down on another. Just help the idols cause him to sin further. Mm. 
Remember, we talked about having compassion for others because fornication is a sickness, right? We did that in part two, I believe. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You can see here from Judah that if we don't have compassion for someone else's struggles with the spirit of fornication in that good mindset, fornication and jealousy will just array themselves against us to bring us into some of the same works. Now, mind you, if we didn't have compassion, fornication would have already been at work. As we are going to see, the Spirit doesn't allow one to do so. So, we should already be on guard if the lack of compassion has place in us to take our time, reason, settle down, and come to the right understanding, or seek the right understanding from Allah Hayyim. So let's get more understanding from Judah here. As he had experience with lust, jealousy, and fornication to help us get the understanding we need to understand and overcome them. If you don't have anything, Sakwa, you can read Testament of Judah 1 and 1, please. And now I command you, my children, hearken to Judah your father and keep my sayings to perform all the ordinances of the Lord and to obey the commands of Allah Hayyam. Well, isn't it funny that the holy commandments and law is the answer to overcome these spirits, so that's why the idols seek to keep us away from them? Yet, the folks who overcame them keep referring us right back to performing and obeying the commandments, even tying back to what Zacho said about attentively listening and complying. You have Gad, he said, seek after the judgments for a peace of mind. Reuben said to love and do truth. Simeon essentially spake on being in the fruits of the law, loving with a good heart and walking straightly. Levi said, fare with the whole heart and walk in simplicity according to all the law. And now Judah is here directing us to performing the law to know the importance of these things for deliverance. Now let's get the rest of Judah's sayings to know what else we need to understand in our warfare against fornication and lust besides performing and obeying the commandments and ordinances. Zakwa, can you read Testament of Judah chapter 17, verse 2 to 6, please? Yes. Beware therefore, my children, of fornication and the love of money, and hearken to Judah your father, for these things withdraw you from the law of Elohim. Man, that's the first thing lust and fornication does. Pull us away from the law, which is what was given to keep our minds and help us use our senses for good. That love of money one right there is very interesting because it's, it's bigger than money, as we both know. Um, mm -hmm. For a Judite, it's to, to love anything. Like any carnal thing, if you love it, you're gonna give yourself over to it, or you're gonna have this affection for it, or it's gonna it's gonna cause you to fall because it it starts driving you, like the love of money specifically. If a Jew they have the problem with money, they're gonna do whatever it takes to get it. Right. So you can see how you're given over to the lust. Whether you have to rob, steal, plunder, kill, uh, whatever it takes, you're going to do it to get what it is that you love. And that's where we have to actually love Allah Hayyam so that we do whatever it takes so that we can get to Allah Hayyam because it's one or the other for us. Like, we have to make a choice. It's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. It's interesting knowing that when he said love of money, that he really was just speaking of lust, period. And seeing that to love anything <clears throat> above Allah Hayyam is idolatry. Yes. Because you're going to 
you kind of put that above him when the opportunity arises to fulfill that desire. So it's important for self-examination to see what do we have, what is there in our life or what is there in the world for us that we actually love more than him. We have to be honest with ourselves because we're supposed to be looking at our hands to bind it. What does it say? Bind it for a sign upon your hands. Mm -hmm. Hear, O Israel, Ahaya, our Allah is one Ahaya, and thou shalt love Ahaya with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. It's not possible to do that while we put more of our energy into something else. So, take the time and look in your life and see what you're putting your energy into and see if it's actually towards Allah Or well, see what's causing you to fall from one of his commandments or some of his commandments. Usually it has to do with what your lust is. So if you're having a problem keeping certain commandments, like before in my life, keeping the Sabbath was a struggle because the love of money was in my heart. So when the Sabbath would come, I still wanted to do business. I still wanted to talk and, and run around and do what I need to do. Yeah, that was a struggle. So I understand it wasn't helping me keep the commandments. Therefore, I understand, hey, this is lust. Hey, there's something going on that I need to deal with that's keeping me and hindering me from actually doing what Elohim is telling me to do. It's, it's, it's very blatant if you're looking for it. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for sharing and showing the candidacy we have to have with ourselves even to be able to see it. We got to be really willing to be honest with ourselves. So after these spirits come in, fornication and lust, the love of anything above Allah Hayyam. What do they do next? Continue, please. And blind the inclination of the soul. Then distort our perception or perspective from the good inclination we were created for to do what's really good to Allah Hayyam so that we can't see or think clearly, taking our time in patience and temperance. Right? And we know what they're using. They're using our desires, that thing that we love or that thing we have pleasure in. All right? This process happens very quick, mind you. We're going slow and talking about it. But it can happen in an instant. All right. What happens next? And teach arrogance. Then lifts us into some spirit of pride, teaching us something to lift us up in arrogance with the heightened sense of self for us not to seek counsel, nor to feel we need counsel, or that we need to be edified. So that desire comes in. They get us to give into it. And then we're not looking to sit down and calm down and hold on. Let me get counsel about this. Let me make sure this is right. Let me seek the judgments of Ahia so my mind can be at rest. No, they're going to get us eager through covetousness. It's going to get hasty. Thoughts are going to start running of how this desire is right, even though we're not looking at the commandments or we're already in covetousness now. So we're looking at the commandments in some instances, but according to our desire. So we're finding what will help us actually fulfill it. This process, it doesn't take long. And fornication is mother of all evil. So she comes, lust is pulling, 
Wickedness is forecasting grievous things. Then deceit comes in the heart to imagine evil. And we're sitting there going through it to fulfill lust. Because I, Zachwa mentioned the lesson, catching the lie, I think. The devil doesn't actually have power. He only can offer opportunities to fulfill desires. So they're literally just playing off our desires. When you sit back and look at it, we're getting played. They're just using us. If you don't have anything, Zachwa. Um, yeah, I do on this. You know, this is too real for me right here. So you, you're, <laughs> my, you're my tribe right now. So. <laughs> got a different scope right now. Go ahead. It's interesting. He said, beware therefore, my children, of fornication and the love of money. He said, for these things will draw you from the law of Elohim. And that's true. Because whether you know it or not, whether you know the law or not, you still have to deal with the conscience. So whether you're aware of all the law or whatever law it is in that scenario, you still have to deal with your conscience because that's the way Elohim has set things up. And for the most part, um, in these cases this is why he's saying beware of it because when it says it blinds the inclination of the soul that means that you completely ain't thinking about Elohim at all and then when it says and teach arrogance because you start justifying what it is that you're doing and for many, in my early days of walking after Elohim, when they said it withdraws you from the law of Elohim because I'm actually aware of the laws, it does. Because what it does is it'll try to find a, a discrepancy in the law. Like, let me give you an example. I, I This isn't one that I've dealt with, but I can is a great example for a discrepancy if you if you're not looking for the answer the scripture said love thy brother love thy neighbor as thyself right yeah. now what if you don't love yourself oh, does that justify you treating other people the way that you treat yourself now, the other scriptures actually confirm what's actually being said, but you can see how it blinds the inclination of the soul and it teaches arrogance. Mm -hmm. And it suffers not a man to have compassion upon his neighbor. See. So you can see it's like it finds ways, it finds places in the scriptures for you to be able to justify the actions And so he said, right. mm, so I see why he said, nor the imagination of the thoughts of your heart. Because with the example, a piece of scripture was taken, but then the personal imagination came in to make it something different. Right. Because the, the imagination is going it, to, it, it's coming, the fornication is in lust, it's coming to help you not keep the commandment. That's the whole purpose. The sole purpose is coming in to help you be more, this is why I said to teach with arrogance, because it's coming to help you be more, um, uh, what's the word, um, confident and doing what you're going to do. Mm 
So that's why you will see many Judites of our brothers and sisters when they fall into fornication or lust, they're very bold in the things that they're doing wrong. Because that's how it works. If I'm going back and forth and I'm unsure about whether it's the right thing or wrong thing to do, then that doesn't blind me. That, that, that means that I'm aware but I have to be blinded. This is what these spirits want. They want me to be blinded. So they have to give me confidence in what I'm doing wrong. I'm sorry, cause I jumped ahead on you. This is no problem. Are you finished with what you were talking about? I am, brother. I thought it's interesting. Allah Hayyam understands what we need and why he commanded or gave in the law to speak according to the law and testimonies and to get understanding through precepts. And David, a Judite himself, he said, through thy precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Mm -hmm. So he was sure to make sure the understanding is actually according to Allah Hayyam and that there's no falsehood of the idols in it. So, and that understanding has continued because Peter, he had said the scriptures are not open to any private interpretation. The understanding of Allah Hayyam is according to precept and it is what it is. All right. It's not about personal opinions because those are the imaginations of the heart that come from somewhere, though it may feel it's a personal opinion. So, knowing we have guidance on how to come out of fornication, performing the law, being obedient to it, listening attentively, and being compliant to do the will of Allah Hayyam. from the heart as something we want to do so that and we'll know it's something we want to do by it not being grievous it's not grievous to hear and it's not grievous to agree with and fulfill okay so as Zacharias was explaining the arrogance comes in to make us confident, and with that confidence in our own will, if you'll continue, Zakwa. And suffer not a man to have compassion upon his neighbor. Then they don't suffer us to be considerate of others or have compassion upon them, solely thinking upon our own needs and wants or glorying in ourselves. Therefore, we will cause others to sin or use them for gain at the expense of our desire, or not have compassion upon them in their struggles, as we lightly mentioned earlier, seeing what happened to Judah. We would also hold grudges in the pride of fornication. Once withdrawn from the law, given to the evil inclination, lifted up in arrogance, with no compassion, we get further into the darkness of these spirits. If you don't have anything, continue, please. Verse 4 of Testament of Judah, chapter 17, please. They rob his soul of all goodness. In the self-will or self-pleasing of fornication, the person would turn every opportunity into something for themselves in the evil inclination, so no true goodness will be in the soul as there is a pretense or hidden agenda for ourselves in lust and fornication, having bad inclinations. Mm -hmm. And oppress him with toils and troubles. It'll affect our mental and physical health because of our unfulfilled desires when struggling with the sickness of fornication 
to be left with the sorrows of unfulfilled desires or the sorrow of the actual sins we committed. And it's interesting. You talked about how even if you don't know the law, the conscience is still there. So the law still has its effect. And you can see here that we can love something else outside of Allah Hayyam and not know Allah Hayyam, know his commandments. But nonetheless, that law was given. That spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit is with us. So our conscience is still affecting us, though we don't understand why, but it's still hitting. And this is why you see in the world, there's a lot of mental health struggles emotional health struggles from our sins weighing us down and our conscience, that spirit of truth, writing everything down on our heart, bearing witness against us to understand like this stuff is very real What and prevalent what fornication is actually doing in the world. Fornication and lust is actually doing in the world today. Yes. And for we Judite specifically fornication, lust, and then because of the fornication and the lust bring forth the jealousy and envy. So it gets pretty um it gets pretty bad because when you're already lusting for something and let's say it's something that somebody else doesn't have, but you you just want it, then you're giving over to that lust, almost like the woman um, that we went over in the lesson with uh, with Joseph, the Egyptian woman, the woman she from, uh, from yeah from Memphis, yeah she struggled with fornication, so it's the All same right. spirit. So you can see that, but if it's something that someone has that we desire whether of jealousy or of or, or of envy say whether they have it and we don't specifically um desire what they have which is jealousy or if they have it and we actually want what they have which is envy then it becomes a whole nother whole nother struggle where you you find yourself falling into a situation like like David with um Bathsheba where it was another man's wife but lust and fornication came in and envy came in because she was another man's wife to the point where he went to the extent of killing the man to get him what it was that he wanted so you can see the extent of where these spirits will take you and how they'll play on you to get you to to sin and go away from the commandments of Allah Hayyam. What transpired with him really helps understand the the blindness of it. Mm -hmm. Like he really unfortunately just got overtaken in that experience. That's how really it happens like that. Yes, it does. we also can see why Allah Hayyam left that testimony for us to understand that you can also come out of it because he took when the fault got brought to his face when that time came Allah Hayyam told him what he did he acknowledged his fault he didn't stay in the fornication to try to find a way out of it he humbled himself and he actually did not do that act again to see how True repentance. Yeah. That's why Allah said he was a man after his own heart. He was sincere. Right. You can make a mistake in sincerity and out of lack of understanding and knowledge. But to do it intentionally or to do it presumptuously, that wasn't in David's heart. So you can see why he was a man after the heart of Allah Hayyam. Because he wasn't operating maliciously. Mm -hmm. Though he did wrong. Right.
We talked in the last lesson, I think, about the sickness of fornication. This thing is serious. It's it literally, if it comes in and gets you, it gets you. Fornication is in a light spirit. It doesn't play around. Mm -hmm. That's why Judah himself is saying, beware of it. If you look at it and sharing this to, for one, have compassion upon ourselves and others, and also understanding to be wise as serpents like we need to be, to know the seriousness of and the focus we need to come out of this thing. Uh, Judah, he had an angel of Allah with him, helping him, yet fornication was still able to find a way in. To know we really have to pay attention. It can happen to anybody. That's essentially what I'm saying. Don't take it lightly. Better guard your eyes and your heart. Fornication okay. enters into the eyes and then it enters into your heart. So senses. you have to be mindful of, you have to one, understand it, and two, you have to be mindful of it, not to fall into it. Because if it enters into your eyes and if it enters into your heart, it takes over your body and your mind. And then that's when you're gone. I've had my dealings with fornication. I, I understand. I've been gone before where I'm following after my lust and and I'm not thinking. I understand it. Praise Allah, I am for giving me the understanding, but I understand it in real-time experiences. Praise him. Praise him. And if we keep reading, you're going to get more understanding of why these things are happening. Let's continue and see. And drive away sleep from him and devour his flesh. So you already have the war that's going on in the mind, the mental instability, the mental health struggles, the emotional health struggles. And now also we'll have sleep troubles because of the anxiety of the mind. As Simeon said, some malicious jealousy troubles us in sleep and it helps keep us in the lust of fornication where jealousy dwells so it becomes uh the attack is pretty much all day and night to keep us in it it becomes what you don't have because fornication is a yearning for something lust is a yearning for something Jealousy, envy, the all you all desire something. This is why Judah had to be very, very careful of what they desire because everything that comes against the Judah is what they desire. So it does drive away sleep from you because you're not getting what you desire. You're always going to want something if these spirits have place. You're never going to be content. So even when you lay down and sleep, you're thinking about what it is that you need to do, what it is that you need, what, like, there's never any peace. And that devours your flesh because there's there's no peace. You're always looking at what you don't have. And that unthankfulness of always looking at what we don't have, what is that going to lead on to here in verse 5? And he hindereth the sacrifices of Elohim. Sorrow will have place in us since we're walking according to our desires in pride, lust, or fornication and not getting what we want. 
so our prayers will be hindered. Also, fornication literally will hinder prayers so we can stay in our lust because prayer helps come out of it when we desire to come out of it sincerely. So there are moments where I'm under duress, but I stop praying, not realizing what's leading me not to pray so I can come out of this. It's fornication. As it knows, you call to Allah Hayyam for help, a sincere and contrite heart, he won't despise. So it keeps us away. Yeah, but you're going to get delivered from what it is that you're desiring. That's, that's the, the part contrary, we play. Right. <laughs> that's the part I play in the matter. That's the, that's the contrary part right there. That yeah. like if I call upon Allah Hayyam, to give me understanding or to help me or to strengthen me in this in this struggle or this battle he may actually deliver me and i may not get to fulfill what it is i'm lusting or fornicating after then i have to humble myself and pride can't come in because he'll give me confidence to go after my lust there's no confidence if I go and inquire. If I inquire when I'm having a thought or when I'm having a feeling that is trying to push me to go do something and I go and inquire of Allah to help me I've already taken the confidence away of the wrong thing that I'm trying to do. And now I'm seeking Allah to then guide me or give me understanding to help me not make a wrong decision. That's humility. That takes me away from the arrogance. Because the pride, the, the fornication and lust needs the pride. Because humility is going to stop me from going into fornication and lust. Humility is going to say, hey, think about it. Is that right? Go and inquire. Go check with Allah Hayim and see if that's right and wait on an answer. Don't just go and give in to your iniquity because you have to wait. It don't work. They don't go together. It takes, it takes away from being an imagination of the thoughts of our heart to stop and right. inquire and keep silence and wait. They definitely but, need each other. But if you don't go the humble route, <laughs> you're going to see what happens and we'll keep reading. Yeah, but <laughs> it's interesting. If we don't go the humble route, we're going to fulfill some sin, right? And then we're going to get afflicted for it because we sinned. And what's going to happen in that experience? Continue, please. And he remembereth not the blessing of Allah. He hearkeneth not to a prophet when he speaketh and resenteth the words of holiness. Because we're in those spirits still, we're going to get offended at the blessing of Allah. To not see it as a blessing. Because Allah, Christ Yache himself, he was sent to bless us in turning us away from our iniquities, according to Acts chapter 2 or something like that but we're blinded in our inclination right now so that blessing to tell us we're wrong for what we're doing or that blessing of our conscience weighing on us because of what we're doing we're not going to remember that that's a good thing that hold on my conscience is pricking me hold on my brother's correcting me no we're going to see it as an attack we're going to see it 
in a means of being offended at what's being said or being grieved at it because we don't want to hear it. Fornication doesn't want to hear it. Pride doesn't want to hear it. Envy and lust don't want to hear it. And those spirits leading us, we also don't want to hear it because of our pleasure in what is being offered. Fornication doesn't remember Elohim's blessing to show us our faults and also doesn't listen to a prophet and resents the words of holiness when it's told to her. So when in that spirit, Elohim will correct us via dream, vision, prophet, or some experience, but we will not listen, resenting the holy words or mishap from our fault that reproved us and cast it off, forgetting the admonitions so as not to have understanding to continue in the unholiness of fornication, doing its pleasure in evil. This spirit even attacks when we may be watching lessons or having holy discourse for growth, talking with our counselor to get understanding. She'll be at work in this because what she'll do when in that dialogue or we listen to that lesson as she resents the word of holiness she doesn't want to hear it so she'll strengthen us not to hear it either by distracting us from focusing and listening or lifting us up when something is said to cast it off because we don't understand it or to cast it off because it grieves us because it's not according to what we think or what we desire. Or wickedness will help by projecting the admonitions onto the shortcomings of others. By maybe bringing in a thought to remember how someone else may have fallen to something we just heard or read or were talking about. And it applies it to them. Or... The info could be used, we'll hear it, and then we'll take it as, ooh, that's what such and such is doing. So when in that situation, I could use that for them. So the admonition will be used to correct someone else. Altogether, it's to keep us from looking at how the admonitions actually reprove us of ourselves. In either case, just to get us not to take accountability, to see the truth of ourselves, and be honest with ourselves, and partake in the blessing of turning from our iniquities by making corrections to come out of the lust. If I can add one thing to what you're saying, um, it'll be emotions. If something happens and you get into your emotions about it or someone does something to you or someone not treating you right or any any type of emotion, fornication they use that to give you confidence to go and sin or go and fulfill your lust. So it works in that way too. For sure. Wrath ever aids such in lawlessness. So she'll send that child over to, to help get us to act. And we're talking about these things. Hopefully everybody's getting to stand on what they need to grasp what's happening or may have happened or what can happen to be sure not to give in or to work on coming out of it. And don't forget to have compassion and understanding and long suffering, knowing that this stuff is, it's a hold. It's a grip. Okay. If you continue, Zakwa, please. But he is a slave to two contrary passions and cannot obey Elohim because they are blind to his soul and he walketh in the day as in the night. The person actually doesn't have the control. The spirits are controlling. It's blindness there. Unfortunately, not aware of what's happening either. Okay. This happens to us and it happens to others if we aren't truly cleaving unto Ahaya with all our heart, soul, 
and might. Not putting anything above him or any pleasure above him. We can't be in these two spirits, speaking of fornication and lust, and also be serving Allah Hayyam. Fornication and lust, the two contrary passions to obeying Allah Hayyam, blinds us from making changes or being receptive to change through the means of what we just discussed to have us in darkness mentally and unable to see what we're really doing, or in some cases, though we see what we're doing, the pleasure in it helps keep us in it as it is a lust we still have or something we still like. Sometimes lust will sound like a heavy word, but it's literally something we still like, something that still pleases us. It's like a person who gets anxious, upset, or confused when a fault is brought up and they can't grasp what's being said because their pleasure is blinding them. So they can't really understand what they're doing or what the person's saying. Or it can be a person that sees what they're doing and will say, you're right, what I'm doing is wrong, but will continue in it because one is blinded, being enslaved to the passions and self-indulgent in giving themselves over to it in their minds since self-indulgence and deceit have no memories to repent wholeheartedly as they help you not remember the evil that was done to put the work into stop, but to continue like nothing happened. You got anything that before deceit we... is interesting. Yeah. Um, yes, the way that Casa just described it is true. But deceit can operate in another way with self-indulgence. Self-indulgence can have its work where you'll you'll fulfill whatever it is that that you lust after, or you'll do whatever it is that is the imagination of your own mind and self-will. But deceit can also work in hiding your sins. It can also work in hiding your self-will or your self-indulgence. So that right there really makes it very, very interesting where you're trying to, you're, you're adding sin unto sin by trying to hide the sin. Hmm. It says he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. That's deceit. The lion wants us to confess. It's all he asks of us. So with confession comes accountability. And there's so many ways to try hide it. To sit there justifying it. Or sitting there finding a way for it not to be what it is. Or continuing in other sins to not have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. right. Deceit well, is deceitful. In, in technicality, um, many of the manipulation tactics come from deceit. Gaslighting, deceit. So you don't have to deal with what it is that actually you did in your self-indulgence. Um, projecting deceit. Um, let me think, I think of some other ones. Um, What's that? Stonewalling. Not even dealing with it. Stonewalling. Blame shifting. Yeah. All of them operate in deceit. Yeah. Yes, sir. To gaslight and change the scenario of what really happened. That's the seat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm walking down them.
right. Let's blame shift the Darvo. That's <laughs> now deceit. Uh, I just no, yeah, like nah, you did it. That's why it happened like that. I didn't do anything wrong. You did wrong to me. So that's why that happened like that. Wow. Because of how I felt. To see. And at the end of the day, you're trying to hide the self-indulgence or the self-will because it's something that you did and then you're using, in some cases, you're using how somebody responded to what you did to justify what you did, not to have to deal with it. So it's mm -hmm. it's all deceit. Yeah. Getting away from accountability. Mm -hmm. And it leaves you in the self-indulgence. <clears throat> So, so now we're about to see why what's going on with self indulgence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's going to make more sense. All right. So, it's our self indulgence by pleasure. We get in lust and the works of the spirit of fornication that helps us keep giving our mind over to them. When we do it, Let's see why it's hard to come out of the pleasure of it. Let's get into the struggle of lust and fornication through pleasure and indulgence. Can you read Hermas, Parable 6, chapter 5, verse 5, please? What kinds of self-indulgence, sir, say I, are harmful? Every action, saith he, is self-indulgence to a man, which he does with pleasure, for the irascible man, when he gives the reins to his passion, is self-indulgent. And the adulterer, and the drunkard, and the slanderer, and the liar, and the miser, and the defrauder, and he that doeth things akin to these, giveth the reins to his peculiar passion. Therefore, he is self-indulgent in his action. This really puts some things in perspective here. We talked about loving something over Allah Hayyam, having pleasure in something over Allah Hayyam. It's self indulgence to a man, everything which he does with pleasure. For the irascible man, when he gives the reins to his passion, is self indulgent. We got to understand whatever it is, it's a pleasure we have in it. In truth, Dealing in truth and assessing in truth is not because of what somebody did. It's not because of what it looked like. Whatever excuse deceit may be using, there's no justification for giving into it because it's a pleasure contrary to what Allah am wills. We have to hold that as our same outlook and perspective. If you will, Zachwa, whenever you, or if you got some there. He that liveth in self-indulgence and is deceived for one day and doeth what he wisheth is clothed in much folly and comprehendeth not the thing which he doeth. For on the morrow he forgetteth what he did the day before. For self-indulgence and deceit have no memories. By reason of the folly wherewith each is clothed. Man. Look how this stuff works. You got folly coming in to help now. She's one of the women of the family of the devil. We'll talk about her in the next discussion, Lord willing. Hopefully you can see how self-indulgence and deceit have no memories with folly helping. Because you got deceit justifying everything and hiding everything mm -hmm. to be able to be accountable for it. <laughs> what happens? It just gets swept under the rug. But... You keep on going without even having to deal with it. Right. Going through the motions. And you mentioned manipulation tactics. Like, 
they use what their family, they're going to use whatever to help stay where they at. It's kind of like a bad tenant. They're going to use everything they can to stay in their house, even though they ain't treating it right. It can be, they'll use sorrow. You did wrong. Okay. All right. Let sorrow come on. Sorrow and sadness come beat you up about it. So you can guilt trip yourself and feel like, feel better. And then we'll continue uh, the show tomorrow. Like it doesn't help change so long as we stay in some one of the spirits of the family of the devil. It's not going to help change and come out of it. I got to give a real time example of this. So this says for self-indulgence and deceit have no memories. So for anyone that's in a relationship with somebody who's struggling with these things, when you may come to them or or you may be grieved about what's going on and you may go and talk to them and they may justify everything that they've done and you still may be grieved about what they did because it didn't feel good. It wasn't it wasn't right. But they're like, you're still there. You're still worrying and, and, and thinking about these things. That's the no memories. They wanted to vanish away and not have any memories of it. But yet you're reminding them that they did wrong because you're still hurt by it. So what they would do is they will push for you to be okay. Like, come on, let's talk about it. Like, just get over it. Just be okay. Come back to who you were before and be jolly and happy so that I don't have to deal with that no more. The key detail in there is you're still hurt because they never dealt with the thing that they were doing. <laughs> they pushed right. it under the rug. So know that key part is not that you talked about it they acknowledged their fault and they actually started doing what was necessary to make the changes. Uh, it's when it happened, they didn't really want to deal with it. Or if they did apologize, it was just to get you to be quiet and right. then they continue on their way. So it requires that you still have to talk about it because the problem still persists. Okay. This stuff is real. Yes, it is. We just don't know what it looks like in in outside of the spiritual. This is these words are spiritual. The physical looks different, but if you understand it, it looks the same. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. So when we continue our lust transgressing against Allah it clothes us in folly to blind us from what we're doing or remembering it to stay in the repentance because of the pleasure we still have in the work that gets us to continue being deceived to continue giving our minds over to the pleasure that we have in it so you can see our idolatry and the pleasure in it to be led by the wrong angel and spirits helps keeps us in the struggle, not remembering or comprehending what we're doing. Okay. Let's learn about this angel of self-indulgence and deceit, please. Chapter 2, verse 1. And he saith to me, Seest thou the shepherd? I see him, sir, I say. This, saith he, is the angel of self-indulgence and of deceit. He crusheth the souls of the servants of Allah and perverteth them from the truth, leading them astray with evil desires wherein they perish. So our evil desires aren't just our own imaginations. As we continue to build an understanding, but there are principalities and powers that pervert us to obey them and lead us unto the evil desires. So this means our evil desires are works of idolatry 
in that spiritual fornication. And it helps understand why Judah said, don't walk after the imagination of the thoughts of your heart. Because those thoughts are not our own thoughts. They're coming from somewhere. And they're using them because they see that we have pleasure in them. That's why I said, and perverteth them from the truth. Because they have to pervert you to agree with the evil desire. And then it can it can work. It can't work without perverting you from the truth or perverting you from what's right. Thank you. Continue when you're ready, please. But they forget the commandments of the living Elohim. Withdrawing from the law, showing the spirit of fornication was involved in this whole experience. Continue, please. And walk in vain deceits and acts of self-indulgence and are destroyed by this angel. Some of them unto death and others unto corruption. I say to him, sir, I comprehend not what means unto death and what unto corruption. Listen, saith he, the sheep which thou sawest, glassum and skipping about, these are they who have been turned asunder from Elohim utterly and have delivered themselves over to the lusts of this world. So, these folks have been given over unto their lusts in this world and turn away from working on changing, turning away from Elohim completely by staying in giving themselves over to fornication and lust, not resisting them. We can end up in this mental state through various spirits. It can be through unbelief in the spiritual fornication of idolatry, like the Israelites did in Jeremiah 2 and 25, saying there is no hope. Also, it can be through fornication, teaching arrogance to lift us up, in prideful unbelief, a person can just give themselves over because they just want what they want and indulge in the pleasure it gives them being enslaved to the passions, as the Israelites in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 11 and 12. I got a question. Are you going to go into um, unto death and unto corruption? Yes, we're going to split those up. Okay, I'm with you then. That's right. Okay. The Jeremiah 2 and 25 that's corruption and what we're about to go into in jeremiah 18 this is the one unto death so we can actually understand what it was talking about in the shepherd of hermes also it can be through fornication teaching arrogance to lift us up in that heightened sense of self to think we're so important that we are delivered by allah to stay in our desires as the israelites thought in jeremiah chapter 7 verse 9 to 10. If you don't have anything, continue in Jeremiah 7, verse 8 to 11, please. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Idols are the spirits working in us if we are of this sort and or our teachers are lying to us. Okay, continue, please. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery? and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other Elohims whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. It's a lying spirit to make us think, or teaching us, that we are delivered to do evil. All right? Continue, please. A self indulgence and deceit. Yes, sir. In this it's house. Justified. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. It's just, that was the justification right there. All right. We are delivered to do all these. If this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes, behold, even I seen it, said Fahaya. 
The spirit of lying, the son of Satan, who makes us robbers of Ahaya, not keeping his spirit pure, and leads us to think doing evil is okay, and we will still be delivered, but he is really getting us damned if we believe or teach such things ourselves. What you're about to see here, this was already happening and and insinuating itself into the Christian faith from the days of old, the concept that we're delivered to do evil and we're going to be saved nonetheless. Can you read Romans chapter 3, verse 8, please? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So, understand that it was already a slanderous report of ancient time of those that were condemning themselves to say that the apostles were saying that we can do evil so that the good of Christ may come. Today, it's been turned into, we're saved by grace, not by works. So we can do evil, yet we're still saved by grace. And whatever other fashion or form that's being relayed to deceive people to believe not keeping the commandments is still going to bring salvation that's one way it goes to be given over to the lust I'm guessing there's something you had wanted to say about the death and corruption and hopefully you can find where to do it within this portion of it because that's what we're going into here all right thanks for the heads up no man there is also the lies leading us unto unbelief in spiritual fornication and idolatry not believing that change is possible through the belief that we can't do it so we stay in our desires can you read jeremiah chapter 2 verse 25 so we can see the 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 way we get led by the lies leading us unto unbelief in spiritual fornication and idolatry, not believing that change is possible through the belief that we can't do it. So we stay in our desires through spiritual fornication and idolatry, listening to the angel of self-indulgence and deceit. <laughs> uh, okay. Jeremiah 2 and 25, please. Withhold thy foot from being unshod and thy throat from thirst. Unshod means like uncovered, so it's like not having shoes on, like being barefooted. Just so everybody understands the analogy. So he's calling us to repentance from the spiritual fornication and idolatry, okay? Let's see the response that will come in unbelief through spiritual fornication and idolatry. Continue, please. But thou saidest, there is no hope. No. For I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. That's one kind of response. And if you can hear the sentiment of it, like, there's no hope. No. No. I've loved strangers. I've been doing this all my life. And after them, when I go, there ain't no hope. It ain't possible to do it. Can't change. Like, this is the sentiment. This is the down, it's like a down, downcast, depression, anxiety over this, this sentiment here. So that's one way. Spiritual fornication, idolatry. As Judah said, they rob the soul of all goodness, oppresses them with toils and troubles. The person's way down. I'm a slave to these passions, and after them will I go. I can't come out of it. That's what this sentiment is. 
It's interesting the context. It says, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. We're definitely talking about idols. For I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. It's like, I'm I'm giving over. I, all I know is these idols, and it's hard for me to change. Because they're all I know. It's a defeated mindset that you don't want to actually put in the work. And you just want things to be given to you. It's like, just come and deliver me. Like It's the same mindset that many of our brothers and sisters have in the Christian faith that we're just going to be delivered. I don't. We don't have to put in the work. We just have to believe. And it's the same. That's the same mindset. And you can see the trauma bond. I would love strangers. After them, will I go? This is all I know. As he said, it's not a healthy relationship. Getting afflicted in our life, but that's all we know. Right. Was he talking about putting this stuff into real context? Like, this is real life. Just as there's trauma bond in relationships in the world, there's trauma bonds with spirits, too. I think they go hand in hand. True, because there's spirits in the relationships. Let's look at the other kind of response, that prideful unbelief that helps lead unto death. All right. But Jeremiah 2 and 25, that's corruption. So we, this is what I wonder. That's corruption. And what we're about to go into in Jeremiah 18, this is the one unto death. So we can actually understand what it was talking about in the shepherd of Hermes. This can be seen as pride goes before destruction. Elohim also calls the proud to repentance from unbelief before things get bad. Can you read Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 11 and 12, please? Uh, Jeremiah 18 and 11. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Ahiah, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. Fornication at work in the proud, resenting these holy words, and you can see it in the response. Continue, please. And they said, there is no hope. So they're saying, there's no hope in Elohim to serve him. Continue, please. But we will walk after our own devices, and we will everyone do the imaginations of his evil heart. Stuff Judah was talking about. That's the response of prideful unbelief. So you can have the two idolatrous mindset that can come from lies. One unto corruption, and one unto death. This proud unbelief, you can see they... They said this from their heart. Like, there's no hope. But we're going to go after our own devices. And we're, everyone's going to do the imagination of his evil heart. Remember we said it's a it's a um slave to the passion. So the person would even know they're wrong, but they're going to stay in it. They said they're going to do the imagination of his evil heart. They know they're wrong. But it is what it is. They're not leaving off from it. As opposed to 2 and 25, the person was grieved. Like, they just didn't, from understanding, they didn't understand what's really going on. They're like, there's no hope. No, like, they're just down. They're not lifted up. Like, no, I'm not doing that. So you can see the difference. Those are two tough mindsets. One it's harder to come out of because the one doesn't take accountability. Jeremiah 18, they don't take accountability and they know they're doing wrong and they don't repent and they don't try. So you can see the difference. Whereas 
Jeremiah is saying they they just they're in unbelief, they're in sorrow, there's no hope. For I have loved strangers. Like I know that they're strangers and I love these idols because I'm operating in them. And after them will I go, I'm gonna stick with them because I'm struggling. I don't know how to come out. That's corruption. They don't know what to do. So they're corrupted. Whereas in Jeremiah, it's unto death because they're going down with the ship. They're not trying to change. Where's the lion for that? They're telling the lion what they're going to do. They said there's no hope. But we, we gonna tell you what we gonna do. Since there's no hope, we gonna walk after our own devices. Like, I'm not gonna take accountability for nothing. I'm gonna let self indulgence and deceit operate. I'm gonna be manipulative. I'm not gonna take accountability for nothing. I don't. It don't matter to me who I hurt. That's a tough mindset to be in. And they may it it can it's tough yes and it can play because deceit is there deceit can be deceiving to think i'm not hurting anybody i'm just doing what i like they know they hurt people they just don't want to take accountability for it like there's a hiding of the sin so the conscience is weighing on it no we're wrong thank you because what will happen is they'll know they hurt you and then they'll bring up what you did to hurt them even if it's something that happened a long time ago or something that it's recent that's when it gets used so that they don't actually have to deal with it or take on that they hurt you see what you're saying thank you mm -hmm. They definitely know they're wrong because they said their heart is evil. Yeah. Jeez. It's presumptuous. It is. Self-indulgent. Self-indulgent is, the meaning is, characterized by doing or tending to do exactly what one wants, especially when that involves pleasure or idleness. So self-indulgent can come in because of our pleasure or because we're idle and not paying attention. And it'll come in and entice us to do something that pleases us. That means that you're not working. One, you're not, you're not, um, you're not examining yourself. You're not um, being vigilant. You're sitting there idle. You just want to take a moment for yourself. You don't want to do anything. And then because of that idleness. Self indulgence comes in. It makes so much sense. How we took a moment for ourselves is a difference between to get out of, because this is a vocation, this is a job to serve Allah Hayyam, it's a duty. Right. But to take a moment to put that duty aside for me, I'm already given into self-indulgence. Right. It's a difference between let me set down to collect myself for the job, to take a moment to meditate or, you know, do what I need to do to perform the work, you know, for perspective.
Well, are you meditating? You're self-examining. Because meditation takes for you to be able to understand yourself and to be able to calm yourself and to be able to be at peace, which is actually doing the work. Like even when you're even when you're not necessarily working physically, you could still be working spiritually and mentally and working on your heart. You don't have to be moving physically to do those things. So David said it. They are my meditation all the day. Thinking about Anaheim. Anything else? No, I'm ready to go better. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go, Cass. So in either case, whether in fornication or pride to be unbelieving, let's see what it means when given over to the lust of the world unto death. Continue in Hermas Parable 6, chapter 2, verse 3. The rest of it, please. And these, therefore, there is not repentance unto life. For the name of Elohim is being blasphemed through them. The life of such persons is death. How is Elohim blasphemed so we can know to hold ourselves accountable not to do it? Second Clement, chapter 13, verse 2 to 4, please. For the Lord saith, Every way my name is blasphemed among all the Gentiles, and again, woe unto him by reason of whom my name is blasphemed, wherein it is blasphemed, and that ye do not the things which I desire. Not doing the things he desires in love and mercy, doing justly and walking humbly with him to do our own desires is blaspheme in his name. All right. If you continue, if you don't have anything, please. Um, us being the temple of Alahayim, serving Alahayim, when we are going and we're invoking Alahayim, we're like, praise Alahayim, praise Yache, praise Ruach Kodoshi. We're saying these things. People are hearing us saying these things. This is why we're blaspheming Alahayim. It's because we represent Alahayim. Each one of us who speaks those names or or speaks to people or or shows or, or or showing through our works that we are changing and we're actually walking according to Alahayim. People are watching us and we're representatives of Alahayim. So that's why when we don't do right, we're actually blaspheming his name. Because we're making Alahayim, just like Paul said, we're making Alahayim the minister of sin. Through our works, through our sins, because we're we're promoting Alahayim. And we're promoting him by our works too. So we actually blaspheme him in that when we're not doing what's right in his sight and in the sight of anyone. There was a lesson at, talking about how Allah weighs us by our actions. Mm -hmm. Overcoming by the attacks of the mind and overcoming by faith. I believe that was the one. No, no, no. It's, it's inside of atoning. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, inside of atoning. That one rings a bell. <laughs> <laughs> that he's truly about action. Even here, it's not about talk. He said, it's blasphemed that you, in that you do not the things which I desire. So what we do, he's looking. And then 
this next verse is going into what you're talking about, how we're talking, but when we're not doing, it's blaspheming. If you'll continue, please. For the Gentiles, when they hear from our mouths the oracles of Elohim, marvel at them for their beauty and greatness. Then when they discover that our works are not worthy of the words which we speak, forthwith they betake themselves to blasphemy, saying that it is an idle story and a delusion. For when they hear us that Elohim saith, it is no thank you unto you, if ye love them that love you. But this is thank unto you, if ye love your enemies and them that hate you. When they hear these things, I say, they marvel at their exceeding goodness. But when they see that we not only do not love us, they laugh us to scorn, and the name is blasphemed. Hypocrisy of speaking of the right thing to do, but not doing it ourselves, is also blasphemy of his name, as Akbar was speaking about. So we would be giving ourselves over to death to give up on working, on changing, and remaining in our own desires while speaking of the right things to do, but not doing it ourselves in hypocrisy. And it all ties back to our unbelief because what we do really shows what we really believe because when they see we're not doing it, they're going to say it's an idle story and a delusion. We don't really believe what we're talking because we would be doing it if we believed it. That's right. It would be because of idolatry we would do this as the angel of self-indulgence and deceit helped get us into that place of giving ourselves over unto the lust of the world. Now, if we find ourselves in blasphemy against his name, we have today for repenting, getting insight, and working on the change, taking accountability. Second Clement 13 and 1, please. Therefore, brethren, let us repent forthwith. Let us be sober unto that which is good, for we are full of much folly and wickedness. Understanding the idolatry and spiritual fornication we have to work to come out of, let's be honest with ourselves, sober in our minds, to keep from the idols, praying for strength, practicing and doing good, and praying and seeking understanding of what's going on within us and what we need to do to overcome. Continue, please. Let us wipe away from us our former sins, and let us not be found to be men-pleasers. This is key, because it's about the lust of the world, right? The desire to please men and gain the world will help keep us in the lust of the world. Because if we come out of the lust, we will start to offend men of the world because we would be pleasing Allah Hayyam. So it's a choice of who we prefer to please. Continue, please. Neither let us desire to please one another only, but also those men who are without by our righteousness that the name be not blasphemed by reason of us. That's what we're working on here today. Learning not to man please, but to truly please our neighbor, whether they are in the faith or not, by righteousness, doing good in the sight of Allah Hayyam to please him, unto edification of others to please them truly, by showing them his ways through our works through our actions and not merely by our words. So being impartial. Yes, treating sir. treating our brothers and sisters in Yache the same way that we treat we would treat a stranger, the same way that we would treat our enemy. So we shouldn't treat a person differently just because of their status or how we feel about them. That's right.
Anything else? No, I'm done. Thank you. That's Let's see. Amen. Let's see the understanding on those who the angel of self-indulgence led to corruption now. So we're looking at that person who is, it wasn't a prideful thing per se, in that they were just, they knew they was wrong and they're not worried about it. They're going to do what they want. But this person's just struggling with their emotions and mental health. To understand there is a better way and it's possible. Let's Hermas parable six, chapter two, verse four, please. But the sheep which thou sawest not skipping about, but feeding in one place. These are they that have delivered themselves over to acts of self indulgence and deceit, and have not uttered any blasphemy against the Lord. So the corrupted are in the struggle of pleasure and deceit yet they aren't speaking blasphemy against the Lord. Though they may give themselves over to the self-indulgence, being deceived to do so, they are not lifting themselves up above Allah to cast Allah law away to establish their own law and have place of repentance when coming out of the spirit of deceit to see clearly and do what's right in the sight of Allah So repentance is possible for this kind. Continue, please. These then have been corrupted from the truth. In these there is hope of repentance, wherein they can live. Corruption then hath hope of a possible renewal, but death hath eternal destruction. All right. So you have the two sides of being in the struggle. One, being lifted up in it, as opposed to being corrupted through spiritual fornication, idolatry, being weighed down not understanding the faith. Allah Hayim, in hopes that we will repent, will make our life hard to help us reconsider what we are doing and truly come to repentance. Can you continue chapter 2, verse 5, please? Again, we went forward a little way, and he showed me a great shepherd like a wild man in appearance, with a white goat skin thrown about him. And he had a kind of wallet on his shoulders, and a staff very hard and with knots in it, and a great whip. And his look was very sour, so that I was afraid of him because of his look. This shepherd then kept receiving from the young man, the shepherd, those sheep that were frisky and well fed, but not skipping about. So he received those corrupted ones who have hope of repentance, okay? And putting them in a certain spot, which was precipitous, and covered with thorns and briars, so that the sheep could not disentangle themselves from the thorns and briars, but became entangled among the thorns and briars. And so they, pastured and tangled in the thorns and briars, and were in great misery with being beaten by him, and he kept driving them about to and fro and giving them no rest. So he's putting them to work as is not good to give an evil servant time to be idle as it gives opportunity for idols to teach more evil like Sirach 33 and 27 talks about. So, and, all right, continue, please. And altogether, those sheep had not a happy time. The chastening seems to be grievous, but it's going to benefit them. All right, continue, please. When then I saw them so lashed with the whip and vexed, I was sorry for their sakes, because they were so tortured and had no rest at all. I say to the shepherd who was speaking with me, Sir, who is this shepherd who is so hard-hearted and severe and hath no compassion at all for these sheep? This, saith he, is the angel of punishment, and he is one of the just angels and presides over punishment. You see how we perceive things makes all the difference. When in the world perspective, 
the pleasure in lust looks happy and free, as we saw, as this parable speaks of sheep just hopping and skipping about. And that pleasure is happy and free in the pleasure of the world. While the work it takes to partake in the holiness of Allah, it looks severe and harsh, but it's just a dark view of fornication and hatred to see things upside down. Because truly, the chastening from the righteous angels for those who are struggling in lust is a good work that he's doing. Right? You see them entangled in briars and thorns where they can't get out. That's a love. He's holding them accountable to change. And they're being chastened, being held accountable to actually do the work. Not being given any free time, so to speak, to be idle and continue in the lust. Or be idle and find a way to go find a pleasure for oneself. But he's genuinely making sure they get what they need so that they can change. If you don't have anything, continue, please. Um, yeah. Um, it's interesting because when it says in Sirach, it says... Um, Hold on. Um, in Sirach 33 um, and 24, it says, Father, a wand and burdens are for the ass, and bread, correction, and work for a servant. If thou set thy servant to labor, thou shalt find rest. But if thou let him go idle, he shall seek liberty. So you see the 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 sheep that were just hopping and skipping around they had liberty because they were idle they didn't have to do any work a yoke and a collar do bow the neck so are tortures and torments for an evil servant so you can see both of which were evil the one hopping around and the one feeding in one place were evil but the one feeding in one place was able to be saved because they didn't lift themselves up against Allah in their unbelief. The one that was eaten in one place was in unbelief, but yet they didn't profane Allah name. Though both were evil servants. So you see the angel of punishment put on heavy fetters onto those that were eaten in one place for the sake of them being saved. It goes on to say, send him to labor that he be not idle for idleness teacheth much evil. Set him to work as it's fit for him. If he be not obedient, put on more heavy fetters. So the angel of punishment actually understands that these sheep actually have to somebody has to be riding them for them to be able to come out of it and to be delivered and saved because they can't do it themselves they can't be they they're they're gonna get laxed and idle because they're not they're not um they're not pushing themselves they're gonna get lax because they don't have the what's the tenacity is that the they don't have the tenacity to put in the work without someone being over them managing them hmm. so we see the angel of punishment has to come in and step in and be over them to then to manage them and push them to where they need to go where it looks grievous because they they're not doing it willingly so it looks grievous because of that reason but it's if they would do it willingly and they were in um what's the word i, I keep wanting to say encouraged but it's not encouraged when you want to when you have the drive to do something yourself well um. A sen it's like a sense of purpose. Um, I 
Like you have the drive. You don't need an outside source to give you the motivation that you need to do something. Whereas these sheep who were eaten in one place, they didn't have the motivation to do what was needful for them to be able to come out of what it was. So they needed someone to push them. And that's what the angel of punishments is doing. Whereas others, they don't need somebody to push them because they can encourage themselves to do it. Whereas these sheep couldn't encourage themselves. They would get down and go into sorrow. So Elohim is giving them what is needful for them, seeing their mindset and what it would take for them to actually be saved and come out of that mindset. It's interesting what you explain. It sounds like that lack of motivation comes from the lust, the struggle of the lust, because of people that just hearing it, a person that has that motivation because they want it already. That's all they want. So they're going to go do the work. But if there's another desire, it will cause that laziness. Mm -hmm. To where you have to force the hand, like put them in a position where, hey, you know, you, you're going to have to work on this and there's no getting around it until they themselves get to the repentance. And it's actually going to go into a, help me if I'm, seen this right because when the angel talked about he gets them back then they truly repent and they serve the lord the rest of their life purely because mm -hmm. then they they come out of the lust like, all right there's no other contrary desire that's keeping me from doing the work and being self-motivated so to speak like because i desire it too right it's only for a time it's, it's only for a time until you break those habits and that they're they're restructured in a new mindset. After the new mindset takes root, there's no need for the thorns. There's no need for the punishments anymore because they've changed. The mindset has changed. The problem is, is coming out of the mindset and coming out of the lust. The afflictions are needed to make that change. To help them change their mind. Did you have anything else on that? Or are you good? I don't. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. We got an understanding of what the righteous angel of punishment is doing to help us by giving us what we need to help change our minds. And our desires to be towards our hand to do the work willingly so that it's not grievous. Hermas, parable six, let's continue chapter three, verse three to see what he's doing, please. So he receiveth those who wander away from Elohim and walk after the lusts and deceits of this life and punishes them as they deserve with fearful and various punishments. This, I thought, that's a good for a righteous perspective to know we deserve these punishments from the angel that Allah had placed us under. Lord willing, we'd be placed under him to be healed. Because it's to help us come to repentance. And it's not a woe is me opportunity, but to be received as good from Allah had because he's given us what we need to help change our mindset. And our desire. You're very much right, Casa. You do deserve it because Allah didn't put you in the place that you're in. He's pulling you out of the place that you got yourself into. You gave yourself over to those spirits in your life. He didn't do that. So the punishments that you receive are just and you do deserve them because you gave yourself over to all those lusts that now somebody has to come and deliver you all right that's the truth that's the facts and 
it helps us to see it that way. It was a lesson where we talked about how the angels, when they hear the judgment of Allah Hayyam, they, they all praise him, saying, Justice, thy judgment, Allah Hayyam. Something along those lines in Apocalypse of Paul. So we can know to take it as facts, like, yes, sir, that's right. Allah Hayyam's giving me what I deserve, and he's right in what he's doing. That's the mindset of the righteous. Even as we read in Psalms of Solomon chapter 3, how the righteous stumbleth, and he holdeth a higher righteous. And he's looking out for what he will do for him. You know, like, yes, I deserve this punishment. Thank you. Let me work on what I need to work on and look for your deliverance from me. Because you punish me in faithfulness. As we seems to be Judah, the tribe of Judah is just topic of this for whatever reason. Yeah. But <laughs> <Like the other day. laughs> well, we're back on Judah again here. Even David, he said, I know, I want to read it verbatim. We're on fornication, you're talking about Judites. Let's, <laughs> let's get it, man. <laughs> this is our struggle right here. This <laughs> right here. Hey, Allah and build this out. Allah and this Judah known, so. It says in Psalms 119, 175, I mean, Psalms 119, verse 75, I know, O Ahaya, that thy judgments are right. So he's like, you're right. What you're doing is right. And that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. So that right mind, this affliction is, yes, you're, you're right. I do deserve this. I did wrong. I shouldn't have did what I did. And I know you're doing this in faithfulness because you also trust. It's your process. You know what you're doing. You're not afflicting me for me to be cast off and go astray, but you're doing it to help bring me where I need to be so I can actually serve you. Right. Whatever point in your life you... You had pleasure in doubt and sorrow. So now that doubt and sorrow is hindering you from serving Allah or being converted. So now you have to go through punishments to cast doubt and sorrow away from you to be able to serve Allah So those two things are what's hindering these sheep specifically from being saved, those that were actually grazing in the in the um that were actually feeding. Those two spirits make it very hard to be able to serve Allah because they have no confidence in themselves. So it becomes very hard for you to have the the um the encouragement or the or the um what's the word Costa? Start for the M. What'd you say? Is it motivation? Motivation. Yes, thank you. Praise Allah. Those two spirits make it very hard to be motivated to overcome something or to put forth the work to do something. As you've seen, those sheep were sitting there grazing in the field. That doesn't take work to go and eat. But it wasn't until the angel of punishment came and put those heavy fetters on them that they actually started having to work. So you can see how that sorrow and that doubt causes them not to put in the work. And that's why they don't change. And that's why Allah has to send help to help them change for that specific group of people. Thank you. Are you finished? Yes. Right. Know that it is what it is and people have overcome 
fornication, lust, self-indulgence, to see all these things before. Just as we talked about David in the same Psalms in verse 71, he said, Firstly, you see, his mindset was already good in that he knew Allah was doing it in faithfulness, right? Then, in the midst of it, he stayed with that mindset to say in verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. He was in agreement with the purpose of the afflictions. Cheerfully going through it. And then eventually he overcame his iniquity. Verse 70, <laughs> verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Just like we're talking about, we get given to our lust, we get inflicted because we went astray from Allah Hayyam. But now have I kept thy word. The process hasn't changed. We have to go through it. And know what's on the other side. We're going to get to where we're actually keeping it. Okay. You got anything? No, I'm good, brother. If you'll pick back up in the um, Hermas Parable 6, chapter 3, verse 4, to see what punishments the angel, the righteous angel of punishment, puts us through for our conversion. I would fain learn, sir, said I, of what sort of these various punishments. Listen, saith he. The various tortures and punishments are tortures belonging to the present life. For some are punished with losses, and others with want, and others with diverse maladies, and others with every kind of unsettlement, and others with insults from unworthy persons, and with suffering in many other respects. For many being unsettled in their plans set their hands to many things. And nothing ever goes forward with them. And then they say that they do not prosper in their doings. And they do if not enter into their hearts that they have done evil deeds. But they blame the Lord. Lust leads us to think Allah isn't doing us right by not giving us what we want to let our desires be prospered. But it's just for an occasion blinding us not to remember the blessing of Allah to turn us away from our iniquities by not giving us the things that would further lead us into lust so that we would actually repent. Continue, please, if you don't have anything. I do. Um, it says, the various tortures and punishments are tortures belonging to the present life. So that means that it's things that's going to happen in your day to day. And then it goes on and starts talking about some of the things that will happen in your day to day. For some are punished with losses, so you may lose something or something may go wrong. Your car may break down. You end up losing something. And others want, so there's things that you may want that you don't get. Others with diverse maladies. What's maladies, cousin? Illnesses. Uh, you get sick, different sicknesses. And others with every kind of unsettlement. So you may, things may be going on in your life. You may be unsettled and be in your emotions a lot. And others with insults from unworthy persons and with suffering in many other respects. Then it goes on to say, for many being unsettled in their plans, for many being unsettled in their plans, so that means that you said that you were going to do something in your self-will and it didn't go through. Allah is actually trying to help you by not allowing your plans to prosper so that you will actually seek Allah He's trying to change the mindset by taking you through the punishments set their hands to many things and nothing ever goes forward with them. So they're trying to do all these things in their own self-will and it's not prospering and it's not working out. 
is actually happening for a reason to help get you out of that mindset, to get you out of those habits of just walking according to your own conceits and your own thoughts so that you actually start praying to Allah Hayyam and seeking Allah Hayyam's guidance on what you should do so that you can actually start walking in faith of Allah Hayyam and being patient and waiting on an answer so that Allah Hayyam would prosper all of your steps. So there is a mindset change that has to happen to take you away from the spirit of self-indulgence and deceit that's actually causing you to walk according to your own imaginations. And that right there is a mindset change that has to take place. And through these punishments, Allah would bring forth fruit. By you seeing that your way doesn't work and having to conform to the way of Allah Hayyam. I had to go through that process. I'm very familiar with that. You have to see that your way doesn't work. It's humbling. Yes, it is. I'm good, Casa. He's all right. I know. He's in the living room. Praise all right for delivering you. <laughs> Man, <laughs> I laugh because I'm like, I'm in that process. And like, man, I lie, help me, man, build me up. <laughs> like, I'm laughing because, like, you know, I'm in it and I'm thankful. Like, I understand where I'm at. You know what I mean? Like, right. praise him. Like, I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> I understand it, man. I'm getting beat up. <laughs> like, I'm like, hold on. Like, and even after, like, even after, like, the real beat up, you know, I still, like, was still, you know, trying to get my feet grounded in it. You know, I would make mistakes here and there, you know, like, I'm, but I was aware, like, yo, I, made, I, I messed up. Like, I knew I messed up when I messed up, you know, after, you know, and I'm like, okay, hold on. You know, and I just got to the point, I'm like, okay, like, when I mess up, don't try to afflict myself. You know, let me fall into the hands of Allah Hayim. If Allah Hayim wants to afflict me for it, so be it. But let me confess it in my heart and let me repent and let me strive not to do it again. And that's how I've been walking. And as time goes by, you get better and better. You know, you get better at it because you're you're doing it. You know, it's the mindset, you know, and eventually... You get good at it like anything else. It becomes who you are. Right. As he says, he exercises love and kindness. He's exercising it in the soul to get the soul where it needs to be. It was uh, Psalms 25 and 9. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. I had one of the definitions in the Webster for meek was, um, what is it? Mild of temper, soft, gentle, not easily provoked or irritated. You talked to me about it, and that struck me from the conversation and going through the process, that being able to see the fault, confess it, and not be provoked myself or irritated but to see it and be thankful. All right. I appreciate it. Let me stay even and work. And wait and see what you will. And keep building. Because getting impassioned about it, it just doesn't help anything. Like, just don't. 
then you get lifted up. Then pride comes in and you get lifted up and you start trying to to afflict yourself or you start trying to punish yourself. Like and then sorrow comes in, like it, you just go into a whole breakdown by not just allowing Alahayim to be Alahayim. Like, yeah, I did wrong. I confess my faults. That's my job. My job is to see my fault, confess it, and turn away from it. My job isn't to to punish myself. There's no scripture that says that we're supposed to punish ourselves. Even even David, sitting here talking about Judah, when David went and numbered the people, David didn't go and punish himself. The prophet came to David and told him he had three options from Alahayim. So it's not our place to be Alahayim to judge ourselves or to judge anyone else. If somebody else doesn't do right, it's not your place to, to make a punishment for them. Unless they're your children. And then you and even in that, you can't do it without discretion, according to scripture. If you don't have discretion, don't do it at all. Be not excessive towards any and do nothing without discretion. That's correct. That's right. Thirty three and twenty nine. It seemed that thing of what a meek person actually is when I read it it helped me understand I'm like so that's how Moses and Aaron David even people were able to make mistakes but in the sight of Allah they were meek because of how they they flowed with it Moses and Aaron they messed up at the rock and they weren't allowed to enter the land but you didn't see them go into a fit and just give up and like that's it i can't do nothing right and be done because they made a mistake they counted a higher righteous and kept moving with their portion hmm. they're content with their portion hmm. right, that's not the will of Elohim for me Alahim prospered uh, J Joshua. Mm -hmm. So that's essential a right mind and understanding to grow and get where Alahim wants us to be. Yeah. Instead of blaming him like he did us wrong. Well, getting in our feelings like we've been done wrong. Right. And, <laughs> and, and a lot of times we don't actually say it. This is where the scriptures come in. But we say it in our hearts. That, but they blame the Lord. You say it in your heart. Because just as a parent, when a parent doesn't give a child something and they throw a fit and they act like the parents done them wrong, same thing. Because you didn't get what you want. You think Alahayim did you wrong. But it just wasn't for you. And it's something that you needed to learn to help you. That what you wanted wasn't going to help you. All right. And as a parent knows what's best for you, they're going to do it even though you don't understand. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Father, man. Father, mother. Parents. Real parents. So, we see we got to go through this. There's no getting around it. Now we get, hopefully... You got some understanding of the right mindset 
and focus and perspective to get through this and come out on the right side of it. Let's see what happens after we get through that affliction, what fruit is going to bring forth. All right. In chapter three, verse six, please. When they that are afflicted with every kind of affliction, then they are delivered over to me for good instruction and are strengthened in the faith of the Lord to serve the Lord with a pure heart the remaining days of their life. But if they repent, the evil works which they have done rise up in their hearts, and then they glorify Allah, saying he is a just judge, and that they suffered justly each according to his doings. And they serve the Lord, bent forward with a pure heart, and are prosperous in their doings, receiving from the Lord whatsoever things they may ask. And then they glorify the Lord, because they would deliver over unto me, and they no longer suffer any evil thing. You see how much having the right mindset helps? <laughs> yes, indeed. Them boys, they realized what was going on in the affliction, and they repented. All right. And they actually glorified Allah Hayyam and stopped blaming him, getting in their feelings. They're like, man, praise Allah Hayyam, you are a just judge. <laughs> I suffer justly according to my doings and thank you for what you're doing to help bring me out of it. It's interesting. You can't give somebody something if they won't appreciate it. No, you can't. He makes sure when we get to this place, Allah am willing be of the number. We're going to actually appreciate what he did and understand that it's him that did it. It won't be a confusion. It won't be no question about it. And this is how a person will have that faith to actually do it with strength. Like, they, I know what Allah Hayyam did for me. I know what I was brought out of. And I'm thankful. I'm serving him the rest of the days of my life. Like, the same way there's a trauma bond, there's a love bond. <laughs> <All right. laughs> <From Allah> Hayyam. <laughs> like, I, I ain't going nowhere. Once, once it's interesting. Once a person has been loved correctly, they're not gonna go back to being mistreated. Michelle, Michelle, you see it with them. Um, the pets that get the shelter, the animal shelter pets. You treat them right. They love you because they done been done wrong. They ain't turn her back. <laughs> they appreciate what they got. It's just like a person. If a person's in a toxic relationship and they come out of that relationship and somebody comes and treats them the right way and actually shows them love and not hatred and say they that relationship doesn't last they're not going to go into another toxic relationship. They're going to look for somebody that's going to treat them the way that they want to be treated and know that it is possible to be treated that way. For sure. For sure. They got a taste of the good life. <laughs> All right. David said, taste and see that Allah is good. <laughs> but you get a taste of it. Oh, stick to it, man. <laughs> It's funny, his stuff making so much more sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, you finish? You no, good? Go ahead. No, I hear you. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> this helps know it's a process to overcome the pleasure and lust and fornication. And when things get hard in life, it's Allah Hayyam justly afflicting us by his just angels so that we would examine ourselves and come to repentance on what we are doing or have pleasure in, acknowledging that it's because of our sins we were struggling, and he righteously chastened us for our healing. And when we truly repent and do right in fruits of repentance, we will be given over to the angel of repentance, and be strengthened in the faith, doing right the rest of our life, not feeling any evil thing, as another angel had told Tobit from long ago. If you read Tobit 12 and 15, and then verse 7, please. I am Raphael, 
one of the seven holy angels, which present the prayers of the saints and which go in and out before the glory of the Holy One. Tobit chapter 12, verse 7. Do that which is good, and no evil shall touch you. So hopefully that helps for perspective and building our faith. And it's interesting that evil is going to come, but we're not going to suffer any affliction because we're steadfast in our home and we can't be moved nothing would be able to because you know Abram had to go through things and all that right but he was found patient and faithful and everything so nothing actually had an effect on him Yache had to go through things but he was faithful to Allah Hayim. it didn't have an effect on him to stop him from doing what Allah Hayim had and receiving the blessing Allah Hayim had for him and we have the same opportunity Anything else in this segment? No, I'm good, brother. Praise Allah. Mm -hmm. Now, let's stop here and understand the pull of the withdrawing from the law and the blinding of the soul that fornication and lust does. Okay? First John 2 and 16, please. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. True, because the world is in idolatry, so the lust of spiritual fornication is in it, withdrawing us from the law and Allah Hayim, and teaching us arrogance to be in the pride of life, all through the pleasure of indulging in our desires, coveting after them. Okay. Can you read Romans 7 and 7, please? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Our desires, contrary to the law, are keeping us in our lusts. So is the law sin or a bad thing that needs to be done away to help us? Continue, please. Allah forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. No, it's holy and good as it lets us know what sin is so that we can keep from it so it needs to remain in effect to help us overcome sin. Continue, please. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So we need the law to help us understand what is good for us and what will harm us spiritually and physically for the law is spiritual. Now, when we covet, lust, the root of wickedness, pulls us from Allah Hayyam in spiritual fornication to sin. Let's revisit that process. James 1 and 14, please. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Fornication, she sees our desires. Just as the devil sees our desires, they're spiritual beings, okay, or spirits. And they use them to draw and lure us away through lust, that malignant root that the devil poured in on the fruit and is now with us in our body. Fornication, she uses that lust to draw us away from the law and entice us with the opportunity to fulfill our desires instead of Allah Hayim's. So, we get drawn off because of our pleasure, then enticed with the offer to pleasure. Then, what happens after that, if you will? Then, when lust hath conceived, they bring a fourth sin. So it had to conceive. It had to mingle and get into the vessel. It had to have place. The thought is now conceived because we agreed with it or it was pleasing to us or 
we didn't truly cast it away from us by dealing with the thought right at that moment, but we let it fester. Or it is festering and we're not taking the time to stop and settle down to deal with it. So we give our mind unto it in self-indulgence after we've been deceived to bring forth some sin in us. All because either we had pleasure in what was being offered from the start to give heed to the thoughts that came in, or we didn't stop to take the time to understand what was attacking us, being hasty in our doings, not to stop and guard our souls. We give in to the desire we were offered in our minds, which brings forth sin as idolatry will always result in evil. Continue, please. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Through envy of the devil came death into the world by lust, the catalyst that fornication uses to withdraw us from the law and Allahayim unto the devil and idols to cause evil and lead us to death, which is the devil's will and desire for us. So understand, if this journey feels hard, it's because of our pleasures and desires that we need to intentionally work to overcome. Can you read James 4 and 1, please? From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? The resistance we are struggling with is our desires that give lust place to tug and pull us. We have to be honest with ourselves about this and also be patient to work and overcome them because lust and fornication does war in our body and will continue to have strength to pull us if we are staying in our desires, continuing to sin as it refreshes the demons that have found place in us. Patience or long-suffering, if you will, temperance and getting understanding to depart from evil is necessary as it isn't an overnight process but takes dedication and purpose of soul working hard in faith to overcome really being one track minded on Allah Hayim. getting in our feelings about where we are or when understanding where we are to get in our feelings about it or when opportunity arises to accept where we are being honest so we can build from there, but we get in our feelings when facing the truth, is actually just other ways lust gets us to stay where we are through pride, doubt, sorrow, wrath, or anger, because it's playing on our desires to be someone else or somewhere else in our walk instead of willing to work right here where Allah has us and waiting on him to see our effort and bring us to the next step when we are ready. As Joseph, who kept working to keep from fornication until Allah delivered him into his next season. Do you want to make a comment? I just want to add. You said pride, doubt, sorrow, wrath, and anger. I'm going to add um, um, I'm going to add uh, deceit. I'm going to add um, that's one more envy jealousy lying well it can be envy unless you want to be somewhere where somebody else is that is a that is a scenario, so I don't want to take that away. <laughs> um, I, I I I was I was I was looking at it in the context of what you were saying, like somebody doesn't want to accept where they are. Mm -hmm. So that more so be like pride, um, hatred is what I think. Hatred. I um. Deceit. Um, yeah, deceit. 
And lust. Lust. There you go. That was it. And lust. Thank lust. You. A lot going on there. I think to sum it all up, idolatry. Yes. Well, spiritual fornication. Yeah. You want something other than what you're given. Or well, you want it even though, <laughs> despite where you are, and don't want to work for it. Faith has them strong hands. She works. But she does. Let's touch on how anger and wrath helps lust keep us in the spirit of fornication. Can you read the definition of anger, please? Properly desire. This is from G3713. Um, this is G3709. Properly desire as a reaching forth or excitement of the mind. That is, by analogy, violent passion. You see the covetousness and anger? Desire. A reaching forth. A want to cause getting into feelings instead of contentment being at peace with the will of Allah Hayyam. if you hadn't watched that lesson grab and hold of contentment definitely suggest you check it out that lesson the whole growth within playlist really it's very good but so anger is at work and desire that gets our minds worked up into passions, disturbing the gentleness and tranquility that the spirit would dwell in. All right? If you don't have anything, if you'll go into the Thayer's definition, please. Yeah. Movement or agitation of the soul, impulse, desire, any violent emotion, but especially anger. Simply understand, anything that gets us in our passions or emotions, moving or agitating us from being bashful, gentle, and tranquil, in cheerfulness, and long-suffering, is just a setup to entice us right into lust and fornication to serve idols. Gotta know the power of being in our feelings, that is, in bad feelings, is vain, okay? Testament to Dan, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, please. Understand ye therefore the power of wrath, that it is vain. For first of all, give it provocation by word. You're about to see how this stuff happens. And remember, this can happen very quick. It doesn't take long, okay? So first of all, you give it provocation by word. Idols speak to provoke us in our minds, into our feelings. Continue, please. Yep. And that can be by projecting. It can be by things that never happened. It can just be you projecting what somebody, how somebody feels or what is interesting. But, yeah. yeah, you're right. It's literally, he said by word. He didn't say which right. word. Right. <laughs> They'll say whatever they got to say. Right. Wickedness or help, you know, to project, to just forecast something that, isn't even real, you know. Then by deeds it strengtheneth him who is angry. Then it gets us to act in our feelings, strengthening us to do evil as it refreshes them. Uh, these deeds you can, it's it can happen very quick. It'd be like how you start carrying yourself, the way you start, the energy you start having towards the person, or in general. You know, it's going to start strengthening us once we're in our feelings, okay? That's why you get strong when you're angry. Because anger, anger is strengthening you. The spirit itself is strengthening you. That's right. And that's where a lot of people end up falling to anger and having the desire for anger or the, um, or having the pleasure in anger because it makes them feel strong. Where when they're not angry, 
they feel weak or they feel like somebody is taking advantage of them or they feel like somebody's not doing them right. But then when they get angry, they feel strong and they feel like they can stand up against somebody. That's you gotta absolutely watch that. True. Excuse me. Sorry. What do you say, Cosmo? I'm saying that's absolutely true. I've done that. That's true. And with sharp losses, disturbeth his mind. Then we feeling we're taking losses because we aren't getting what we covet or lusting after, not realizing we're serving other spirits to get what they want for us in the things we also have pleasure in. Instead of seeking in singleness the will of Allah Hayim and what he wants for us to stay connected to him. This is that Zachwa mentioned in the beginning is how if we would stop and inquire of Allah Hayyam, it brings humility and takes away all the noise to be silence ourselves, as Naphtali said, and purify our hearts and wait for our answer from Allah Hayyam. He'll get us out of all this. All right? Unfortunately, if we continue in, where these spirits are already leading us. We got anger and wrath here working and covetousness because we're taking sharp losses after things that we want. Let's see how it continues, please, Aqua. And so stir up with great wrath his soul. And we go into sorrow and depression or fits of frustration through our idolatries, not grasping what transpired because of our lust and pleasure in giving our minds to the wrong feelings that are outside of the true love in Allah Hayyam and keeping his commandments. And fornication is there making it happen as she robs the soul of all goodness and causes toil and trouble. And there we are in the mix. So we have to keep from getting emotional about things and receive everything as good from Allah Hayyam because we're not supposed to have our own desires so we can be kept from lust and fornication's pull through our wants and the vexation of wrath and anger, thinking we're not getting what we want because we understand it's truly what these spirits want and have pleasure in that they see we also have a desire for or pleasure in that would help them get a reaction from us. In um, the lesson... <clears throat> It's either catching the lie, it is catching the lie, I believe, where we have to convince ourselves that we're over it by our actions. We have to do works to convince ourselves that we're not, that we don't have pleasure in these things anymore. This is along the lines of that lesson. We actually have to not agree with the thoughts, keep not agreeing with it, or work to come out of agreement with it. So that eventually it's not something we actually agree with and we'll know it's true because it's shown in our actions and what we actually do. Okay. And that we will is no there's no um blasphemy of Allah in, in talking good but not actually doing it. Taking everything as good from Allah Hayyam and not getting emotional is a growth in faith. Remembering Christ already told us, have faith no matter what, because Allah Hayyam gives us what we actually need, just like he takes care of all creation. Uh, continue in verse 5, if you don't have anything, please. If you fall into any loss or ruin, my children, be not afflicted. Because we take it as good learning experiences from Allah Hayyam. If we don't take it that way by getting in our feelings, what does wrath get us to do? Continue, please. For the very spirit maketh the man desire that which is perishable, in order that he may be enraged through the affliction. See that getting in our feelings to be afflicted about things just helps wrath enable lust to lift itself up to desire something that is perishable with the sole intent of getting us angry. All right, continue, please. Uh, 
And if ye suffer loss voluntarily or involuntarily, be not vexed. For from vexation ariseth wrath with lying. That's all these spirits are seeking to do is open us up to emotions in wrath as envy sees through its feelings to come in to rule our minds to get us jealous then lion is gonna be in jealousy too and we will be right in the lust of fornication before we know it so no matter what comes upon us don't be afflicted or vexed about it remaining always gentle and tranquil and cheer patiently waiting on the will of Allah Hayyam through temperance, understanding, and long-suffering to get the mastery over all evil. Mm -hmm. Continue, please. I got something here on mine. I don't. What I help you in this is don't set your heart upon something that Allah Hayyam didn't give you or Allah Hayyam didn't say it's for you. Because the whole thing with anger, it comes when you feel like you suffered a loss or something, or, or ruin. I mean, like something didn't go right. And based off of that, is when you fall into vexation. So, to alleviate that, don't set your heart upon anything. If you suffer a loss, it wasn't for you in the first place. That's why you lost it. If something doesn't go your way, it wasn't for you in the first place. That's why it was ruined. Learn your lesson and see, hey, I should have inquired about that. I should have waited on an answer. Because that'll keep you away from anger. I see my children every day, and I, especially my little son, Joshua. He falls into anger with his brothers and sister. And I see it. It's usually something that one of them has, and either he may have it, and they may, you know, pick it up. He may put it down. They may pick it up. He felt like he suffered a loss. So he gets angry. But really, did he suffer a loss? Just because it's in someone else's hand doesn't mean he lost it. And I'm just using him as an example because it's, it's relevant. But a lot of times it's the way we're viewing things that causes anger to stir us up. Like even a ruin, if something doesn't go our way, that doesn't mean that it's bad. So it's it's really the way that we're viewing things that allows anger to stir us up and to vex us because our desire is upon it. And that is the key, is that we desire it so much that if if it doesn't work out or if we lose it, we fall into a fit of anger. And that right there shows you that you're lusting and that you're in fornication so that you can actually understand and see it in real time. Like, hold on, I'm too attached to this thing. Like I'm getting in my emotions about it. Like even your car you suffer any loss or ruin with your car, don't be afflicted. You have to see, okay, what did I do wrong? There's a bigger, there's a bigger, there's a bigger um, lesson in it. 
okay, man, what I do wrong? Did I not inquire? Did I not did I not wait on the answer? Um, am I do I have too much passion towards this car? Do I hold this car at a high level, a high value toward myself? Is my heart set upon it? Like once you start really understanding how these spirits trigger you, it makes it 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 actually purges you. Because then you understand yourself. Like, okay, I am doing that. Now I see why that spirit has place. Why is able to get a reaction out of me? It's because of me. Done, Casa. Praise Allah. Hey. <clears throat> Knowing that everything is opportunity for learning and growing and understanding ourselves so we can better understand what we need to do to serve Allah. You know what you said is really great because if you understand the purpose of these spirits is just to help us understand ourselves and purge us, it helps take away from being upset about the stuff anyway. It's a part of the perfecting. Just purging you. Because if I understand that if I don't give myself over to anything, then nothing can get a reaction out of me. And I know that what I'm supposed to be doing is giving myself unto Allah Hayyam. If I'm giving myself over to the commandments and bringing forth fruits of the spirit through through keeping the keeping the commandments, then there's nothing that this world can do to get me into an emotion because this world can't take a commandment from me. Whereas this world can take, it can take something that I'm lusting. It can take that away from me. It can take something that I'm coveting. It can take something that I'm, I'm, I'm prideful about. It can take, it can take all of those things. But there's no way it can take a commandment from me. There's no way it can take a fruit of the spirit from me. Amen. Amen. You good? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. If you'll continue in verse seven, please. <laughs> <laughs> Moreover, a twofold mischief is wrath with lying. Think of these two in layman's terms as being emotional and dishonest. Whether in thought or outward show. Okay? Continue, please. And they assist one another in order to disturb the heart. We can't be at peace in heart in our emotions and not being honest. All right? And when the soul is continually disturbed, the Lord departs from it and Belier ruleth over it. A continual habit of being emotional and dishonest gets us under Belier's rule. Belier is Satan. Okay. There we see what fornication, the mother of all evils, has done through her children to draw us unto Belier to be ruled by him as she desired by using our desires, pleasures, and passions, and emotions, and dishonesty against us. Um, Testament of Dan, chapter 3, verse 5, please. 
this piece. But Raph ever ate if such in lawlessness. That's what being emotional does. Brings us over to the law of the devil, to be lawless in self-will, doing what we desire, forcing the issue of our actions into something for ourselves, fornicating against Allah Hayyam, not fulfilling his desires in singleness of heart. Continue, please. This spirit goeth always with lying at the right hand of Satan, that with cruelty and lying his works may be wrought. Wrath in our feelings works with lying to bring us to Satan's right hand, as fornication wants us to be near him. So being emotional and dishonest are two powerful spirits in drawing us unto the devil. Now in regards to cruel dealings, fornication and lust doesn't suffer to have compassion, so the result of that would engender cruelty to go with that dishonesty. So when wrath is aiding in lawlessness, because of the self-will in lawlessness, we would be self-seeking in that evil inclination, forcing things for our own gain, not being honest and genuine, as lying is with us, to conceal the truth, and it will lead to cruel dealings because fornication doesn't suffer us to have compassion upon our neighbor, to be considerate of them, and how what we want or do affects them, nor to be honest with them out of love. And we do it unknowingly as we are blinded in the deceit from these spirits and pleasure we have to indulge and give our minds to the works that we are believing in our minds and how we feel to operate the way we are as if it's justified or correct walking in darkness as if it's the light like judah said because we are enslaved to the passions knowing fornication and lust needs wrath to get us in our feelings by what we hear so that envy who sees through its feelings can rule our mind to be jealous in some way so that we would get into the lust of fornication we have to be mindful not only to avoid being afflicted or vexed, but also not to be provoked from peace in our soul to any agitation to be too high or low, as it's just a setup for wrath to work with fornication to lift us up in our mind, so we would be looking for a reason to get in our feelings about something we hear. If you pick up a testament of Dan chapter 4, verse 3, if you don't have anything yet. Therefore, when anyone speaketh against you, be not moved to anger. And if any man prays of you as holy men, be not uplifted. Be not moved either to delight or to disgust. Pride can work in either one. Okay. We got to be even and temperate to keep from this whole agenda of these spirits not being too high or low to be able to be in that silence where we can hear and hold fast the will of Allah Hayim. but if we are up and down in emotions by wrath at work eventually anger will find place itself and anger helps keep us in fornication against Allah Hayim by making us think we're justified Verse 4, please. But first it pleaseth the hearing, and so maketh the mind keen to perceive the ground for provocation. So that's what wrath did with fornication, to lift us up, having pleasure in what we hear, to give our minds to the desires. Then what comes next? And then being enraged, he thinketh that he is justly angry. Anger comes in, and it wants us in fornication through our feelings because it gets to control us to work the iniquity of self-indulgence. Continue, please, in chapter 1, verse 3. I have proved in my heart and in my whole life that lying and anger are evil. 
because they teach man all wickedness. See why wrath needs to get us to anger? So that anger with lying can teach us wickedness, projecting evil thoughts to help us get in our feelings or stay in our feelings and be lawless and get us away from Allahayim, walking according to our own understanding, which is truly their understanding. Then anger makes the body its own to sin with wrath aiding in the lawlessness. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Chapter 3, verse 1, please. But anger is an evil thing, my children. For it troubleth even the soul itself. And the body of the angry man it maketh its own. And over his soul it getteth the mastery. And it bestoweth upon the body power that it may work all iniquity. So instead of power to change... Worshipping idols, being led by them, leads to power to do evil, and it just helps refresh the idols at work. Continue, please. And when the body does all these things, the soul justifieth what is done, since it seeth not aright. And there is a struggle to come out of it, because we'll be in our feelings justifying what we're doing, not seeing things right. And then, when the words of holiness is shown or said to us, fornication and lust are at work in us. So we reject it, resenting the words of holiness, and don't want to hear it because of our contrary passions, driving away the good in that evil inclination. This is unfortunately how we get stuck in spiritual fornication, family. Because being fallen into the wicked desires, we don't hear things in truth anymore, having our own view clouded with the wrong spirits. That's true. Stuff is real. Can you read Testament of Joseph chapter 7 verse 8 please? For if a man have fallen before the passion of a wicked desire and become enslaved by it, even as she, whatever good thing he may hear with regard to that passion, he receiveth it with a view to his wicked desire. So you can see, this is what fornication does, blinding the inclination with lust helping, and then anger is there, because you have the anger or the wrath because you're not getting what you want, you can't see straight. And everything you hear, because you desire that thing, you're going to make it. Well, these spirits are going to lead you to make it into that thing that you want. Right. And that's, that's any evil spirit. Yeah, that's jealousy, desire. envy, pride, anger, wrath, um, fornication, lust uh any of them any of them can can blind can blind you it says, for if a man have fallen before the passion of a wicked desire and become enslaved by it so once like it, it has dominion over you it's hard to be able to see anything outside of the viewpoint of that spirit Right. Unfortunately, it's hard to talk to us when given over to the bad passions of these spirits that they find that we have pleasure in too, as we hear what we want when in them. Yet, Allah is gracious. He will give us experiences we need to humble us by his righteous angel so that we will be willing to listen in his timing. Can you read James 4 and 6, please? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, Allah resisteth the proud, 
but give it grace unto the humble. Hopefully with understanding this now, we open ourselves to the process, humbling ourselves to beware of getting emotional and always being honest so we can come out of fornication, her lust, and her children's lust and their works to keep from the devil and all of his family. Continue verse six, 7, please. Submit yourself, therefore, to Allah Hayyam. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of Allah Hayyam, that he may exalt you in due time. Cast in all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Right. That was First Peter 5, verse 6 and 7. So, that's what our focus needs to be. Getting under Allah Hayyam. And his protection. Be patient and cheerful and keep working so Allah may see the effort and give a remedy to exalt us out of the struggle in his timing. Keeping focus on him. Sirach chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, and then 5 and 2, please. Cleave unto him and depart not away, that thou mayest be increased at thy last end. Whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully, and be patient when thou art changed to a low estate. For gold is tried in the fire, and acceptable men in the furnace of adversity. Sirach chapter 2 verse 2 Set thy heart aright, and constantly endure, and make not haste in time of trouble. Avoiding haste and staying out of our feelings is important. And avoiding haste when we realize we're in our feelings to slow down is important. As hatred works with Satan through hastiness of spirit to cause us to fall, according to Gad chapter 4 verse 6. So it helps to stay out of spiritual fornication when we take our time and reason to make sure we're actually in the right space. Um, 1 Peter 5 verse 8 and 9 please. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Steadfast means to be firm in belief, determination, or adherence. Being alert physically, and mentally and courage against the attack is necessary to be steadfast and strong to do the commandments. We have this definition here. H553. It's a primitive root to be alert physically on foot or mentally in courage. Confirm, be courageous, of good courage, steadfast steadfastly minded, strong, establish, fortify, harden, increase, prevail, strengthen, or strengthen self, make strong, all right, obstinate speed. If we're alert in mind and of ourselves physically, paying attention to what's going on in us and without us, how we're operating, how we're feeling and everything, paying attention to our body language, our energy, how we're feeling, to make sure we withstand the fleshly desires, we will be steadfast-minded, strong in the faith, an increase in growth, being established in Allah Hayyam, prevailing over the devil, because we will become obstinate and well-doing, not being moved by evil passions. Can you read Joshua 1 and 9, please? Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For I hire that Allah is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So he wants us to be courageous in alertness, but also wants us not to be afraid or dismayed 
so we can actually do his will. The definition of afraid in H6206 is to awe or intransitively to dread, hence to harass, be affrighted, afraid, dread, feared, terrified, oppress. We can be oppressed by spirits, being harassed by the thoughts they give to make us afraid or dread change to conform to Allah law and let go of ourselves. Allah doesn't want us to be afraid of the change though. The definition of dismayed is H2865, a primitive root, properly to prostrate. Hence, to break down, figuratively, by confusion and fear. Be afraid, make afraid, beat down, discourage. Hopefully, through the discussion today, you can understand it's these spirits that do this. And we can't be afraid for the process no dread to go through the process nor be afraid or dread to embrace the change and then we also can't be dismayed which also means discouraged in the process to get beat down or not work because of the confusion or fears these spirits tempt us with to fall and take away our peace and sound mind in the faith. In wickedness, she is chief in projecting wicked thoughts to make us fear and not remain temperate to reason on righteousness calmly to know the truth of the matter and not to fear to continue the work. If you read Wisdom of Solomon chapter 17, verse 11 and 12, please. For wickedness, condemned by her own witness, is very timorous, and being impressed with conscience, always forecasteth grievous things. For fear is nothing else but a betraying of the succors which reason offereth. We got some good understanding today in grasping this here. She's timorous herself, as we know from talking about her. She suffers from nervousness, anxiety, or lack of confidence. Press with her own conscience. Using that, always forecasting something grievous. Something that's going to get us in our feelings and cause us to struggle. Well, we know Hopefully we know now, Allah didn't give us a spirit of fear to be timorous, but of a sound mind and love to work. And be impressed with conscience for us with the calling of the gospel. If we're sincerely working and learning, we shouldn't be pressed with conscience. If we're pressed with conscience, it's because we're being pricked, which we should take heed to to change what we're doing or increase our effort to make it a hundred percent effort so that there's no guilt weighing on us because we know we're given everything we have and that will help us now in her forecasting grievous things you got to watch it because for fear is nothing else but a betraying of the succors which reason offereth. This thing here, they understand if we would stop and take our time and reason, we would actually be succored by the truth of the matter through Allah Hayyam. But they play on the hastiness and getting us afraid and worried so that we won't see things are right because we didn't slow down and take our time. They play on it and they understand what patience and taking our time actually does. This 
ties in with the if you keep silence with purity of heart, you understand how to hold fast the will of Allah. Uh -huh. You gotta actually stop and settle the mind. Breathe, pray to Allah, inquire what to do in the situation or what his will is. Because just like Zach, what you said in the beginning, that even though you don't know the law, the law still stands. Yes, it does. <laughs> Even though we may not know what to do in that moment, Allah Hayyam is still Allah Hayyam. That prayer, calm down, silence, wait and be patient. He it says in the law, and he is truth himself, that if we decide to do good, we will be helped. And you have to hold on to simple things like that and stay there and wait because wickedness knows if you sit there and reason and wait on Allah Hayyam, you're going to be succored you're going to have yache so they play on the hastiness they play on the emotions and the worry and the fears the doubt because they know that's what they need us to do okay You have anything before I continue? No. Allah Hayyam doesn't want us to get beat down or discouraged, as he didn't give us the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind and love. So he wants us to put our hands to the plow in faith and work to do his will. If you read Joshua 1 and 7, please. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. It's that straight. Be strong and very courageous. It takes a lot of courage to do this. Be single-minded, not going to the right or left from the law in any other deity's doctrine or thoughts so that we may prosper in Allah Hayyam in all things. Continue, please. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So, we got to spend time reading, studying, and meditating, reasoning on the law, and making it our perspective, so that what comes out of our mouth from the heart is according to it, and the thoughts that we act upon is according to it so that we may prosper and have success in Allah Hayyam. This goes for everybody. We read of these people in the past and see how they prospered in Allah Hayyam. We also got to consider men like Joshua. He had to read out of the book of the law and meditate on it day and night. David, he was in the law. You read about it in the Psalms. The kings, it was actually a commandment for whoever was king. They would actually have to get a book of the law and read it. Levi teaches to read out of the law without ceasing, to have understanding all the days. We need it. We have to sow good things in our soul. Our mind has to be on Allah Hayyam. Even to avoid pride, though, Psalms 10 and 4, to have Allah Hayyam in all our thoughts. You have to be thinking upon him. He'll protect us knowing that fornication and lust, the first thing they want to do is withdraw us from the law. All right. If you if you don't have anything, if you testament of Dan chapter five, verse one, please. Observe therefore, my children, the commandments of the Lord, and keep his law. Depart from wrath and hate lying. That the Lord may dwell among you, and Belier may flee from you. 
Our bad emotions or passions and dishonesty won't help us be courageous to do right. So cheerfulness, temperance, and truth and long-suffering will keep Allah amongst us. Continue, please. Speak truth, each one with his neighbor. So shall ye not fall into wrath and confusion. That truth is in the law of speaking peaceably so that wrath and confusion doesn't beat us down from our goal. Continue, please. But ye shall be in peace, having the Elohim of peace, so shall no war prevail over you. We can prevail with courage to be alert and working hard in temperance to get understanding and be long-suffering to have mastery of all evil deeds. In Testament of Dan 5 and 2, it says, Speak truth, each one with his neighbor. Right? And that was, that's the thesis. That's the main part, right? If you do that, so shall you not fall into wrath and confusion. So you're not going to get into your emotions and you're not going to get into confusion, which the confusion comes with the lying. And we know that confusion comes when the devil comes in. It says, James 3 and 16 says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Whoa. So we get to see that if you speak truth, it's going to keep you away from falling into wrath, and it's going to keep you from falling into every evil work because you're actually speaking the truth and you're not allowing the devil to come in where he brings confusion. He doesn't want truth. First Corinthians 14 and 33 says, For Elohim is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So we know who is the author of confusion. So if we're having a struggle with lying or deceit, we have to put forth more effort into speaking truth with our neighbor and speaking truth to ourselves and others so that we won't give place to the devil and that Allah may have place. Amen. Praise Allah for that. No, what we are learning about these different spirits like jealousy, lust, fornication, vainglory, envy, and such, this stuff is important. As these very spirits are among the causes of the unbelief and service of Satan in these times to come. If you will read Ascension of Isaiah chapter 3, verse 21, and then uh, 27 to 31, please. Uh, the Ascension of Isaiah chapter 3, verse 21. And afterwards, at his approach, his disciples will abandon the teachings of the twelve apostles and their faith and their love and their purity. And there will be much contention at his coming and at his approach. There is jealousy with strife at work to bring contention lifting folks up as only by pride come contention and we know this is already this is from the devil because we just read about strifing contention stuff comes from him all right jump to verse 27 please and in those days there will not be many prophets nor those who speak reliable words except one here and they're in different places because of the spirit of error and fornication and of vainglory and of the love of money, which there will be among those who are said to be the servants of that one and among those who receive that one. Zach will explain that because of these spirits, 
and people not ridding of them in their vessels, people will be taken over by them, and their vision will be according to their lusts and not according to Allah Hayyam. As that's a, aligning with what we just read in Testament of Joseph, chapter 7, verse 8, that when given to a wicked desire, that's what we see in here according to. The ones who will receive Satan will struggle with the spirit of fornication, error, vainglory, and the love of money. But those aren't the only spirits that will be at work in his servants. Continue, please. And among the shepherds and the elders, there will be great hatred towards one another. For there will be great jealousy in the last days. Hatred and jealousy will also be at work in those who receive him and serve him. Continue, please. For everyone will speak whatever pleases him in his own eyes. The sign of knowing a person is struggling with the spirit of fornication. To be in hatred, vainglory, error, jealousy, love of money will be speaking whatever pleases them in their own eyes instead of only speaking according to the law and testimony to have a light in themselves as Isaiah 8 and 20 speaks of and speaking it according to precepts to get understanding as Isaiah 28 verse 9 and 10 speaks of okay speaking according to what pleases us in our hearts in the struggles of the spirit of fornication and her children will have a major effect to lead astray the world. If you will continue verse 31, please. The prophecy of the prophets who were before me and my visions. It makes the law, prophets, and testimonies ineffective to help folks change and be saved when speaking according to the desires of our heart continue please also the two witnesses after me they will make ineffective it will also cause folks not to believe the two witnesses to come to believe the gospel they'll preach of the kingdom to be saved and there is a reason the children of Israel will do all of this to make ineffective the law, the prophets, the testimonies, and the two witnesses. If you keep reading, please. In order that they may speak what bursts out of their own heart. To establish our own righteousness of our hearts and not submit to the righteousness of Allah Hayyam is the reason. So let every man look into his heart and examine himself to be sure to work and overcome the struggle with any spirit so as not to be found in the place of destroying Allah Hayyam's work in his law, prophets, testimonies, and witnesses by speaking against either one and or receiving Satan when he comes because we still have pleasure in the spirits of his children because of fornication. From here, we, Lord willing, will get into understanding Satan and his family as there are specific spirits and children of his side that help keep us in the struggle. Anything else, Zachbar? Um, praise Allah Hayyam. We hope everybody enjoyed the lesson and you stuck with us through the whole lesson. Praise Allah Hayyam. We hope you were edified and it helped you in your walk and your journey. Um, please go and look at the website if you haven't, www.hebrewreaders.com. Uh, we thank you. We ask that you subscribe, hit the subscribe and hit the bell so that you can get all the updates when we drop any new videos, any new um, information. Uh, we love you all. We love all supporters. We love our church members, our family. May Allah be glorified. Thank you for that, Brother Zakwa. Amen. All right. Ciao with the challenge. Ciao with the challenge. Peace.
HRC, 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 HRC,